Okay, here we go. I hope you are excited today like I am excited. We are going to dive into the science of the mind and, of course, the physiology of the brain and the body and how this is affecting our lives in a major way, right? Um, it went, you guys, it all comes down to um, how we're thinking, right? And I'm going to adjust the camera just a little bit. Um, it all comes down, it all comes down to what we think about, right? What we think about, we bring about in our major way and, and our thinking is affecting every single part of our life, right? So if, you, if you're taking notes or you, if, if you're driving and you don't take notes, <laughs> but if you can take notes, I want you to jot this down. I want you to think about it. Your life is at least 80% psychology. Think about that. Your success, 80% psychology. Your failures, at least 80% psychology. It's so much of what's going on right here. Like we, we want to think that it's, oh, it's, it's this stuff over here. It's, it's the tactics, it's the strategies, it's the tools or the resources. And it is all those things, absolutely. But it's 80% how we're thinking. Woo! Okay, now. Like, let, let's get this turning. I want to have a lot of engagement here and comments and questions, and we'll have a dialogue. Um, but I want you to think right now, and if you, if you can, if you're in a spot where you can throw some um, something in the chat box here, I want you to do this. Like, how, when you, when you just pause to reflect on this, how is your thinking affecting your life? I know that's a big, broad question, but I want you to jot some thoughts down in the chat box. How is your thinking affecting your life? How is your thinking affecting your life? See, when I, when I was out on my own, so those of you just joining us, um, just, uh, we're, we're talking about the science of the mind. So we're gonna, talk about, we're gonna talk about psychology and we're gonna talk about physiology, both of it. This stuff is so fascinating. I've been geeking out about it. Um, just absolutely love it. But the question I want you to think about right now and throw in the chat box is how is your thinking affecting your life? How is your thinking affecting your life? Nice updated picture there. That looks great. You guys look good. <laughs> um, how, is, how is your thinking affecting your life? Like, let, let that chime in. So here's, here's part of my story. So as a young man, right, I was out on my own at an early age. And I, man, you guys, I got desperate to know like the secrets of success to be truly happy and truly successful. And so I started reading everything I get my hands on. I started noticing and observing, paying attention. I started asking and interviewing. I just became hungry for knowledge and truth and information insight. I had to, I had to know what makes the difference. Why do some people win and some people lose? What's happening? And it's in, it's in everything. It's in health. It's in finances. It's in your faith. It's in your family. It's marriages. Like it's business. It's all of it. Sports. It, like, why is it some people lose and some people win? And as I started studying and researching, I came across it again and again and again. That the major role was that the, in the difference, the, way, the difference of the way they think. It's the difference in how they think. Okay, so I'm going to keep repeating my question until you guys answer here. This, is, this is, can't be just so passive. It can't be so one-sided. I get sick of hearing myself. Come on, you guys got to talk here. How is your thinking affecting your life? And I know it's big and broad. I'm leaving it open on purpose. But just pause for a minute and reflect. Think through the aspects of your life. Think through each area of your life. How is your thinking affecting your life? We got to really dive in here and start seeing this. How is your thinking affecting your life? And then we'll, we'll dive into the whole science of it all. And we're going we're gonna to geek out in a cool way. Don't, don't worry. We're not going to like 
go over your heads here. It's going to be super cool and fascinating. I know I'm going to give you some tools and strategies that will help you control and direct your thinking so that you can control and direct your life. But how is your thinking affecting your life? Come on. And if you don't, if you don't want to chat, if you don't want to type, turn, jump on the mic, turn on your mic and share. How is your thinking affecting your life? Man, don't, don't make me. I'll sit here silently all night long. <laughs> I'll do it. Don't make me. Don't make me do it. Ooh, okay, great one. Thank you. We think that I'll be able to start tomorrow. That's an excellent one. And I'm, I'm, I'm confident you are not alone in that one. I hear that a lot. We put things off. That's, that's one of those thoughts, right? Uh, I'll, I'll get to that tomorrow. I'll get on that tomorrow, right? That's a very, very common one. And that's, that's, why, that's why people come up with, with these, these great statements that they become cliche, but they're true. Is like, never put off till tomorrow what can be done today. Or in fact, what needs to be done today. That's true. It's cliche and it's been overused, but it's true. So you're right. <clears throat> and, and let's, if you're taking notes, start jotting these down. We'll kind of do some contrast here, right? We'll contrast the thinking and the habits, the patterns between the psychology and the physiology of what works and what doesn't. So what seems to not work is procrastinating important things. I'll get to that tomorrow. I'll get to that tomorrow. Here's what's interesting. We often procrastinate important things because we're constantly responding to urgent things, dramatic things, things that are right in your face. You're putting out fires with kids or with employees or you know, customers or clients, whatever, right? It, it's, it's demanding your attention or you get all caught up in it, right? And so then you put off the important things, the ones that would really make a difference because you're constantly doing that. Who can relate to that, right? Who's with me on that one? You're constantly doing all this stuff. And so you always like, I'll get to that. I'll get to that, right? And you don't get to it. But those are the things over here, the things you're not getting to, you're putting off till tomorrow are the things that would make the biggest difference. So we could actually do strategic, and you jot this down if you want to think about it, do strategic procrastination. So in other words, you purposely procrastinate less important things. Let that sink in, my friends. Purposely procrastinate less important things. I think most of us do the opposite. We're checking off our list of all the easy things to do. We're checking our messages. We're checking our emails. We're running errands. We're doing all these little things because those are easy and they feel good. It's fun. Check them off. Check, check, check. I feel good. I'm busy. I'm getting things done. But what we're doing is the things that would actually really move the needle in our favor. Those keep getting per perpetually procrastinated. They're getting put off too much. And so if you find yourself thinking, yeah, I'm going to get to that. I'll do that tomorrow. Stop yourself right there and say, wait a minute. That's not successful thinking. That's unsuccessful thinking. Do the most important things first. That's, that's a great example. Great example. Um, okay, here's another one. My thinking causes me to second guess myself too often. Excellent example. Another fantastic one, right? And I know you're not alone in this one either. I, I, you guys, I get to work with wonderful people every single day. This one comes up all the time. In fact, write this down. I, I tell this to my clients. Your greatest limiting factor in your life are your own limiting beliefs about yourself. Or another way to say that, the greatest obstacle in your life, jot that down, please. The greatest obstacle in your life is your own limiting belief about yourself. Oh, yeah. You guys can give me a big old hug next time we see each other in person for that one. It's huge. If we are constantly second-guessing ourselves, 
if we're plagued by self-doubt, right, then what happens is we psychologically and physiologically, this is where we get into some cool science, psychologically and physiologically set ourselves up for failure. When you, check this out, right? Is there a difference? Is there a difference when you walk into an important meeting or you work on an important project or you meet with an important client or you have a, need to have an important conversation with a child or a spouse? Is there a difference in the outcome if you go in with a sense of clarity and certainty versus go in with like, oh, crap, I hope this works. Jeez, I don't know that I can do this. Ugh. Right? Is there a difference in the outcome? Absolutely, there is. Absolutely. I know I told some of you this story about Andre Agassi. Some of you may not know who he is. He was one of the best tennis players ever. And when I was a kid, he was just smashing it, just winning all the tournaments. He was, he was one of the best in the world, right? If not the best in the world. And then he got on this losing streak and he was just losing and losing and losing. And so he hired Tony Robbins to be his coach and said, help me, like, help me get off my losing streak. And of course, Tony's like, well, it's all psychological. Uh, you've already won. You know the techniques, you know the strategy, you have the skill, you have the habits, everything's in place. What's off is your psychology. So he, he watched him. He got video of him walking onto the court to one where he won, just smashed it, you know, killed the tournament. Then he got video of him walking onto the court where he lost. And he, he pulled up the film and he watched it. And then he watched it with Andre. He, he sat him down. He says, okay, watch this film right here where you're walking on to the tournament you lost. What were you thinking? He's like, I remember exactly what I was thinking. He says, when I walked on the court that day, I was like, man, I don't know if I can beat this guy. Right? But let that sink in. He walked onto the court in self-doubt saying, I don't know if I can beat this guy. And he wired himself psychologically and physiologically to lose. Then he, he showed him the different film. He's like, here's the film. You walking on the court of the one you just, just destroyed everybody. What were you thinking at that moment? And he says, I remember that moment. He said, I walked onto the court and I remember thinking to myself, why did this guy even bother to show up? Hoo -hoo -hoo! Right? You guys with me? Like total difference. And what you think about, you bring about. I, I know that sounds kind of like, well, do, do, do. how are my thoughts really determining my outcomes? But when you, when you dive into it, it's true, isn't it? Our thinking determines our outcomes. And we're, we'll dive into the science more of it, but I really wanted to hit this home. And, and specifically on this, this thing that you mentioned, that our thinking causes us to second guess ourselves. And so it like it, it almost undoes what we already had going. So it's two step forward, one step back, or sometimes step forward, step back, step forward, step back. So we're not making any real progress. Who's with me on this? Right? Uh, here's another one. And there's a few more of you who've joined us. We just I just asked the question: how is your thinking affecting your life? And I want like, and, and again, it's gonna affect every part of your life. So if you guys want to keep the comments coming, keep them coming because I want to. I want to come up with as many specific examples as possible so that you and I were crystal clear about how thinking is affecting our marriage. And we cover that big time in our marriage course, how thinking is affecting your health, how thinking is affecting your parenting, how thinking is affecting your faith, how thinking is affecting your finances and your business, right? And the condition of your home and your environment, your space, your car, your office, your desk, the work you do the quality of the work you do. Your thinking is the determining factor in all of that. And the more specific examples, the better. So let's keep going. Here's another one. Uh, personally, this is what, in the chat box. Personally, when I'm dwelling on the hard things about the day, my thought process just turns negative. Whew, great example. I start being annoyed with everything and everyone. Okay. I'm clapping not because that happens, but because this is a perfect example of the science of the mind. And it makes the days longer and life just completely unbearable. 
holy cow like i could <laughs> i could have paid you to written that that chat right there that comment wow because it illustrates perfectly the science of the mind okay here we go gonna, we're gonna break it down so you start dwelling on the hard things okay and i want you to write this down here's here's one of the cool science things of the mind what you focus on you feel please write that down even if you've written that down before write it down again and put an exclamation mark by it and underline it and circle it and like memorize it and think about it all the time. What you focus on, you feel. Now, how, do, how does this play out? Well, ask yourself, do you tend to focus on what you have or what you don't have? In, in big, big research studies that were done, most people tend to focus on what they don't have. But think about that. There's a perfect example. What you focus on, you feel. If we focus on all the good things that we have, we get filled with gratitude. If we focus on what we don't have, it, it lends to some ingratitude, right? And some want or even some scarcity thinking. Isn't that interesting? It's just like, well, we focus on what we already have or focus on what we don't have. Here's another one. Do you focus on what's going well or what's not going well? And th these are the big questions of, of like general human tendencies, right? Do you tend to focus on what's going well or what's not going well? From a lot of the research, I think it was like 80%, 80 percent, 80 something percent of people tend to focus on what's not working, what's not going well. Think about that. How does that affect your feelings? Whether that's in your marriage or your parenting or at work or in your house or whatever, right? Chores or whatever you're working on, your project, anything. What do you focus on? If you focus on what's going well, how do you feel? Like, well, you're, you're praising your kids and you're, you're sending love notes to your spouse and you're, you're high-fiving your coworkers or employees or you're, you're doing great work for your employers. Like you're, you're winning. Like when you focus, it, it all just goes well, right? And it's just like, this is great. You feel good. You feel exciting. And you actually create the momentum you want to get the things done that, that aren't going well, right? We should spend the bulk of our time focused on and, and helping things go right instead of that tiny little bit of things that are not going right, right? It talks about that in the Anatomy of Peace, which is an excellent book, by the way. So there's, there's a case in point there of like you focus on what's not working. Well, how does that make you feel? Frustrated, irritated, annoyed. You start believing that nothing works out for you when in reality, like so much is working for you. So much is working amazingly. Your life is awesome. But when you focus on what's not working, you feel like, who's you with me on this? Like 90% of your life can be going so well and there's 10% you still need to work on. But if you focus only on the 10%, you tend to forget about the 90% and all of a sudden you start throwing this pity party and thinking your life sucks. Hoo -wee! Right? So in this excellent comment, if I dwell on, and it's not, it's not that a passing thought, you know, passing thoughts can come. They'll come and be like, man, this is hard. Yeah, it's good. But if you dwell on it, if you let it stick. So here's another science of the mind. The ideas that tend to stick around and they tend to wallow, Right? So you dwell on the things that are hard, then the process, my thought process turns negative. So you start to feel negative. Okay. Then it goes to the next one. I start being annoyed with everything and everyone. Um, I've asked this question to a lot of audiences when I've gone to speak or presented in person or online. I love to ask, what is your major predominant emotion? What's the thing you feel most of the time? Do you know what was the most common answer from adults, especially women and moms? When they stop to really think about it, they're like, man, I think the, most, the emotion I feel most of the time is some kind of frustration, some form of being bothered or annoyed, right? Wow. And it's like, and, and it was cool. It was a cool experience because they're like, that's not, that's not what I want to feel most of the time. 
It's not how I want to do life, but what you focus on, you feel. And if we focus on the annoying things all the time, we focus on the things that are hard, then, and I love how you said this, when we dwell on what's hard, the thought process turns negative. Then you start being annoyed by everything and everyone. Even though everything and everyone isn't being annoying, but that's what we start feeling because that's what we're focusing on, right? So your thoughts create your feelings. And so you can reverse engineer this at any time, you guys, and say, what am I feeling? And stop and go, wait a minute, what am I thinking that's causing that feeling? What am I focusing on consciously or subconsciously that's creating those feelings? Isn't this amazing? I don't know if you guys are excited or what, because nobody's turned their cameras on and you're all just <laughs> sitting there quietly listening. Come on, there we go. Oh, thank you. Yes, love seeing your beautiful faces. Okay, so then I love, I love this, Abby, thanks. So said it makes the days longer, right? So now it starts to affect the experience. So the thought affects the emotion, the emotion affects the experience, the day seems longer and life is just completely unbearable, right? It feels that way, doesn't it? And, and then all of a sudden we're operating in survival mode, like, oh, if I can just make it through this day without, without killing a child or a patient or an employee or a client, right? Or my spouse. And, and it, it, it managed, it's, it's challenging. It's crazy challenging, but it all comes back to, if we go back upstream, you guys, it all comes back to our thinking. It all comes back to our thinking and what we focus on, we feel. You ready? No, she's not ready. Okay. Rachel and I are horribly ill right now. So you're, you're getting the very sick version of the two of us. Um, we've just been hanging on, <laughs> man, I don't know. I don't know what it is. It is wretched, Obviously, terrible. It must be COVID or at least caused by COVID. <laughs> like, oh man, it is horrible. It, so anyways, just, just a little moment of pity party there. If, yeah, if, if either of us passes out on camera, it's all right. We'll recover. Don't worry. Don't worry. We got this. We got this. Okay, here's another comment. Over the past year, I have been paying close attention to my thought processes and my family's mental state. Ooh, thank you so much, Stephanie. And how we influence each other, either positively or negatively. Who's noticed this in your homes? right? So now, not only does your thinking affect your feelings and your outcomes and your perceptions, it actually radiates an energy. So part of the science of the mind is that every thought has an energy, right? So think about this, like, if, if, if you're sitting there like, gosh, I love Rachel so much, that has an energy, doesn't it? I don't even have to say anything. If I'm sitting here and just feeling and thinking love for Rachel, it has an energy, okay? Let's do this. Rachel's sitting here just, she doesn't say anything. She doesn't change her body language. She sends her things. I am so annoyed at him. If he does that again, why am I the bad guy? But, oh, sorry. I, she, she's like, why am I the bad guy? I don't, sorry, I was just using yeah, another example. It's, it's, it wasn't going to be me thinking annoying thoughts about you, babe. Oh, that never happens. <laughs> um, but if you have an annoying thought, does that not create an energy? Who's with me? Who's felt that energy from someone else? Yeah, you know you feel it in yourself. <laughs> you're like, I won't mention any pointy fingers. <laughs> we feel it. If you're married, you felt it. You felt the energy of a thought towards your spouse and from your spouse. Same with your kids. If you're super annoyed at your kid and you're trying to communicate, are they going to pick up on that? Yeah, they totally will. Thoughts have an energy. So you're right. You're, you're spot on, Stephanie. It begins to affect the others, both positively or negatively. It has been so great to now start seeing more and more clearly how we, I'm, I'm reading from the comments here again, how we can change our thinking within moments. 
and improve our feelings and our moods. I'm going to dive into that in a second. It's a real mental exercise to reverse negative thinking. And obviously, it's way easier to keep fueling a positive mindset. Yeah, recovery. I found reco recovery is more, more challenging than just staying in a positive mindset, but it is possible, right? In fact, one of the things I do with my clients is I help them change their state. If they come to me in a negative state, in fact, I, had, I met with a client today that had a total, he called it a panic attack over the weekend, just, right? And I'm like, hey, let's back up. What happened? And he let his thoughts, his negative, fearful thoughts just spiral out of control, right? You guys know this. We've all done that. We, we hear something on the news and all of a sudden in our imagination, we're lying in the gutter dying all alone, right? And all is lost. Like we totally do that psychologically. We run these, we, we spiral out of control into the gutter. And so when we let our thoughts run wild and we don't catch them and stop them and get mental recovery, then it creates all those feelings that experience and, and man, terrible, terrible emotional, psychological and physiological experiences. Um, so we'll come back to we'll come back to changing your state. Um, so another comment here. Yes, you can tell when someone's annoyed with you too. Absolutely. Um, I'm also noticing more often how my children are watching to see my way of dealing with things. Yes, yes, right, and then they decide how to act. I hope you parents have all noticed that. It is spot on. Your kids are learning psychological mastery or mental mastery from you. Let that sink in. Your kids are learning psychological mastery from you. They're watching, they're paying way more attention than you think they are. <laughs> You think, you think they're in the corner, like just doing their thing. They're watching, like, how does mom handle this? Ooh, something just happened. How does dad handle that? Right. They're learning from our modeling, how to handle the psychology of it all. Good stuff. This is when Rachel adds her comments from her little corner of pit of despair. I'm not even sure I'm ready to get on this camera, but okay. <clears throat> Hi, I'm here. Yay! <laughs> um, I just want to add, because I always want to add, why is this camera season like, I don't know. Maybe not in focus? Um, maybe it's my eyes. I don't know. I just want to, okay. yeah, except we're darker. Anyway, it's, it's fine. It's fine. Um, no. Oh. <laughs> Just let me say my thing and okay. sit down. Say okay. your thing. Say like, your thing. Stop. Um, because whenever we're talking about this, I know for me, I have this tendency of thinking, oh, that means I have to be perfect all the time. Like I have to show my kids this perfect mental mastery 24-7, 365 days a year. And I think that it's important to remember that part of mental mastery and psychological mastery doesn't mean that you're not affected by things or that you don't feel negative emotions, but it means you learn how to deal with them in a healthy way, right? So if you feel anger, Okay, feels anger, but deal with it in a healthy way. Maybe that means you have a punching bag or you. Why did I don't you know. just point to me when you said that? I wasn't pointing <laughs> to you. What are you doing? She's talking? like, get a punching bag. Okay, you have a punching bag. That's right. I do have a punching and bag. And that is one way we taught. We had a child that had some anger issues and we taught them to deal with that with a punching bag. Okay. Um, if you feel sadness, well, feel sadness and, 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 and let yourself feel those emotions. But the problem is a lot of people don't know how to deal with negative emotions in a healthy way. And so they end up stuffing them 
um, very often what happens is they stuff their emotions until they vomit their emotions on people, right? So they stuff down all their, their sadness, their irritation, their anger, their whatever it is, until then they end up vomiting those emotions when they get upset and they lose it. And then they get mad and yell at their kids or their spouse. That's the unhealthy way of dealing with it. But if you get angry, okay, show some anger and even say, I am so angry right now because of this. I'm so angry. I'm going to go punch a punching bag or something. Like talk, talk through it. Tell them what you're doing and why. And that it is okay to be angry sometimes. And it is okay to be sad sometimes. And it is okay to be like, uh, what's a good word? A, a positive turn on depressed. <laughs> it's okay to not be like 100% all the time. Sometimes we're discouraged. Sometimes we're overwhelmed. Those are all natural part of life. Um, even now, I mean, Greg and I have been sick for, I don't know. Since it feels Saturday. like an eternity. Yeah, really. <laughs> now you have stuff in your teeth. Oh, good. Um, and we're not like just sitting around like Pollyanna happiness here. We don't feel well. And so we're laying around not feeling well. We're not pretending that we don't feel well in the name of being this great psychological example for our kids, because sometimes we're sick as human beings and we don't feel well, right? That's okay. Now we're not, hopeful. well, you do better than me. <laughs> we're not trying to wallow in this sickness, although there's maybe a little wallowing going on, but <laughs> I'm not trying to be mean to everyone and, you know, grumpy. I'm trying to maintain, you know, some, what's the word? I don't know. That's about it. I'm done. For the thank you thank you for your yeah, moment thanks. thank you for your moment okay um so well let me I, i'll read i'll read this another comment came in here i had a slap in the face experience one day when my kids immediately started yelling at each other over the littlest thing i had to really humble myself and readjust my mental state good good example we have to catch that so what i wanted to do today was give all of us some really practical tools and strategies to improve our, our, our minds, right? And again, this has to do with psychology and physiology. Now, none of us is as smart as all of us. So I would love for you to share the things that help you both psychologically and physiologically. It, it's super important. Sometimes people discount the, the, the physiological effect on the brain and our thinking. So let's do that real quick. What are what are physical things that you know mess with your thinking? What are some physical things you know just mess with your thinking? Can you turn the light back sick. on? Being sick, Rachel says. Any, anybody here when you're sick, like your mind is like just torments you? <laughs> like when you have a fever or something, or when it when it's just off, like oh you're just laying there and your mind's driving you crazy right okay what are some other things yes thank you amy not enough sleep oh, yeah. this is probably one of the biggest problems i see right now in our society this is a chronic massive problem all the way from children to you guys <laughs> adults are not getting enough sleep or at least enough quality sleep. And most of it's just like, you're not getting to bed. Or you're getting woken up. Now, obviously, sometimes you get woken up. If you have kids, you're like, yeah, kids woke me up, right? I think we've gotten woken up every single night for the last, like, it's probably two weeks. Better. It is not helping us recover. It is like torture. But the little girls, our littlest, they feel terrible, right? So they're waking up in the middle of the night, too. So we're waking up like, oh, my goodness, this is torture, right? And that happens. But we can't blame it all on our kids. Some of it is you staying up too late watching Netflix, isn't it? Let's be honest. <laughs> or scrolling on your phone or something. Something's keeping you up. But please, please, please get enough sleep. And it has to be quality sleep. So that, that would be the number one. So if you're going to make a list today, physiologically, make sure you're getting really good sleep. Do whatever you have to do to get good sleep. 
If you need a better pillow or a better mattress or better covers, you need temperature, you need to darken out your room, you need you know more set bedtimes or set wake up times, like do, do whatever you have to do to make sure you're getting good quality sleep. Okay, another one. Here, this one's interesting. So Stephanie says disorder around the house, right? can actually disrupt us. Who's experienced that? Who's with us on that one? When your environment is off, when your environment's off, it can throw off your thinking. I, I, know, I know that doesn't seem to make sense, right? You're like, amen. Really? Yeah, we're getting an amen from the crowd over here. But when your environment is off, it does affect your thinking. Please don't think it doesn't. Even when there's a little bit of disorder, whether it's in the kitchen or the garage or your desk or your car, you'll feel it. It affects you. And if you want to optimize your thinking, you have to organize optimize and organize your space. The first thing I do whenever our routine's been thrown off or we've been on a trip, the very first thing I do to start getting the routines back going is I first organize our space. Were you, were you guys able to hear that? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. It's and, and if you want to do that, if you need recovery, if you need some kind of mental recovery, just start cleaning something. Clean it, organize it, get it, get going. Just move your body, get something to like take control. Of like I'm going to clean off this space or this drawer. <sighs> okay, let's go. Right. Get some order to your space. She said also like too many cloudy or rainy days in a row. Now that. That's true for me that, too. That affects you. I don't think that affects me. I like it. And Rachel's like, yes, cloudy days are the best, but I'm a sunshine guy, right? I love sunshine. So I've, I've felt that too. Okay. How about this feeling dehydrated or not eating well or being hangry, right? Yeah. <laughs> hangry will do it all day long. So will dehydration. So I did, I, I did some research. They said about 80% of people are chronically dehydrated. Okay, now the brain is a lot of fat, okay? The brain's made out of good fat and it needs healthy fats. So if you have a very low fat diet, like I'm good, healthy fats, you guys. Well, if, if you have a low fat diet, it affects cognitive functionality. There's tons of really cool research about this. The so the brain needs fats. There's misconceptions about what healthy fats are because of the stuff in the 80s. Well, yeah, so they started like in the 80s and 90s is like, oh, oh fat, fat is going to make you fat. And so they went everything no fat and high sugar and it had the opposite effect. <laughs> like we have 70% of our country now is overweight or obese and it, it's and sugars heart disease. And, and heart disease and diabetes and all this stuff, right? So you guys know all this stuff already, but get some healthy fats, get hydration. Hydration is affecting saying, your brain. Healthy fats are actually saturated fats. Okay, thank you. I'm just clarifying because lots of people think saturated fats are unhealthy, but they're actually healthy. So, and you, you, we could cover all this, but you can do research and just get some good, healthy fats in your diet. Get plenty of water. If my, may I make an invitation here? Stop drinking soda. All of you, <laughs> please. I beg of you. Stop and start eating, and start eating, <laughs> and and replace it with grass-fed butter. <laughs> butter and what? Yuck! That's disgusting. Um, but please, no more sodas. So high sugar stuff like that, <clears throat> it actually has a direct effect on your brain. It goes in your bloodstream, goes up there. Um, Doctor Daniel Amen has done a bunch of really cool research on this. So if you guys want to geek out about the brain and stuff. Um, his research, he's written multiple books. He's got really great interviews. He's got a Ted talk and a success magazine talk. He did that's really fascinating, but he talks about what simple carbohydrates do to our brain, what sugars do to our brain. He specifically mentions what, um, alcohol does to the brain. It creates divots in the cortex. Yeah, sure. And so same with sugar. Yep. Sugar and alcohol had similar effects. They create these divots. And if there's a divot where they're supposed to be brain, like something's yeah. off. Right. And he talks about sleep. He talks about all kinds of food things. Um, but there's just tons of physiological things that are affecting our brains negatively. And what's interesting, I think all of us have experienced kind of the cloudy brain, right? Where you're just like, man, I don't seem to be firing really well. What we don't always catch, though, is when we're not functioning 
at that level, right? Sleep is a good example. They found that a little bit of sleep deprivation, it will take students to a grade level lower in cognitive, in cognitive function, but they are not aware of it. So the same thing happens for us. You might be operating at a grade lower level cognitively because of what you've been eating or not sleeping very well or dehydrated or not getting enough fats or foods like you, you with me. So all of this stuff is starting to affect our brains. And if, if something's off physiologically in the brain, let's, let's roll with that. You, let's, let's do this perfect storm. In fact, I'll give you an, an actual example. This college student, she comes from a great home where mom cooked great meals. They ate all these healthy meals. She goes to college. She's there her first semester. By the end of the first semester, like she comes in to see her professor and she's like, I'm, I'm anxiety, freaking out. Like I'm, just, I'm afraid. I'm depressed. I hate my life. I hate everything. Like it's all falling apart. Like oh, this is horrible. And and he's like, okay. Um, he's like, did this happen before? He's like, no, just since I got to college. And he's like, well, and and luckily he did this. A lot of a lot of really great these researchers, like all of Dr. Any, um, Dr. Dr. Amon's clinics and lots and lots of clinics are this. The very first thing they look at when people come in for help is food. And so luckily this professor caught that. And he's like, hey, can I ask you something strange? He's like, what did, what did you have for, for lunch today? And she said, oh, I was so busy. I had so much to do. I, I think I had a bag of chips and a Mountain Dew. And he's like, huh. That's interesting. What did you have for breakfast? And she's like, uh, yeah, I was running late. I just got right up and I, I think I just had a Mountain Dew. <laughs> and he's like, how often do you do this? And she's like, um, actually, I think I'm doing that every day. And so this poor college girl went from having a healthy diet of home cooked meals to literally surviving on Mountain Dew and like chips. And he's like, here's your sign. Physiologically, you were so off that of course you have to be psychologically off. You with me? Who's with me on this? Like you got, I, I know you know this, like what, you feel better when you work out? You're like, no, <laughs> no, it hurts. Dang it. <laughs> I sweat. And then I have sore muscles. What are you talking about? No, but you like, it helps you feel better when you're, you're working out. You're not giving your cells the tools they need to function. Yes. Yes, that's worth saying again. Rachel said, you're not giving your cells the tools they need to function at their best. And so again, that comes down, you guys know this, regular exercise, moving vigorously, all the research they're doing that's coming out actually over the last moving like- Moving at all is better than not moving. Yeah, just moving. If, if all you can do is move, great. If you can, it's called HIT high intensity interval training. And all that means is like for 30 seconds, you move fast, right? So if you were to go out and walk fast for 30 seconds and then walk slow for 30 seconds and then walk fast for 30 seconds and, and that kind of stuff is so good for the brain and the body. So if it's air squats or push-ups or jumping jacks or swimming or dancing, like whatever, just high intensity with intervals. So run up your heart rate and your breathing and then take a rest, right? That helps your brain big time because it, it sends everything through your artery here. You're hitting the gas pedal to your brain and it lights it up. It's really, really good for you. So eating well, sleeping, all that good stuff. Um, anything else you want to add on that? Anything else you guys want to add? Again, like what's helped you? Keep, keep throwing it out here. What has helped you physiologically or psychologically to make sure you stay on your mental game? What helps you stay positive? How do you recover when you get in a negative state? Breathing. Oh, yes. Thank you, sir. That's a huge one. Anybody here familiar with Wim Hof? He's a guy from Scandinavia. He did all this research on breathing. And he holds all these world records, like 27 Guinness Book of World Records for things. And it's all around breathing. So here's, I'll just give you the quick version. When you do breathing exercises, just sit down somewhere comfortably and just breathe 
loudly and deeply. So if you hear it, you know you're doing it live. So it's like this. And do that maybe 20 or 30 times, you actually start getting tingly. Your lips get tingly, your fingers get tingly. So don't do it standing up in case you fall over. But breathe like that. And our what you're doing. Pass out one yeah, our son passed out one time. He was going hardcore. He's like, <laughs> like, ah, come back. Um, but I've done that. Like we've literally done it all around the world. We do it for mountain training, training for high altitude and oxygen deprivation. Obviously, our brain operates, our whole body and brain operates on oxygen. And so if we can oxygenate it, it's better. So many of us have poor posture and low breathing. I mean, can you picture yourself at a desk or on a phone? Your shoulders are forward, your head's down, your chest is enclosed, your breathing is shallow, and we're spending our lives like this. It's affecting us. It's affecting us. So getting that breathing in there and moving our bodies and opening everything up, you're going to feel way better and you're going to think clearer. You make better decisions. Okay. Here's another one that I want to hit hard. Thank you, Amy, for sharing this. She threw in there. She's like, I have to limit the news, right? Got to limit negative input. So if you're taking notes, please, please, please write this one down. You cannot begin to control your life until you control your input. I will stand by that one all day long. And I know there's a lot of people who are like, it doesn't affect me. Oh, I listen to it all the time, but it totally doesn't affect me. I just, you know, I just got it on the background. It's whatever. No, it doesn't affect me. It, it can't not. Input determines output. So we have to, my friends, it is absolutely mission critical that you control and filter your input. Make sure it is positive, right? Make sure it's big picture stuff, not like we, we would all be better off by studying history and, and uh, philosophy than we would by just constantly consuming current events. You, you with me on that? The big picture thinking. And, and unfortunately, like the, the news, for example, like they're a business. They're, they're in business to make money. <laughs> and they found that... Like the, the headlines that hit are the ones that are shock factor. They are all about shock factor. If it is a gorgeous day and it's perfect for a drive, they'll be like, but watch out. On beautiful days like this, a deer might jump right in front of you and it would be the end of your life. So be careful when you're driving, right? And you're like, what? You just ruined my like perfectly good drive. <laughs> what now? So they, they want to shock you, right? So we, we cut out the news. If there's something really important you need to hear, I promise people will let you know. <laughs> I promise. Be careful who you listen to. I, I know you know people who every time they open their mouth, it's something negative. So limit that, right? Limit that interaction. And man, just keep the negativity at bay. Make sure you're consuming. So not only control and filter the negative input, but really get some good positive input. Be proactive about feeding your mind. Because look what your mind will grow on what it feeds upon. Your mind grows on what it feeds upon. Rachel says that's a weird way of putting it, <laughs> but right. But what you're, what, what you feed it, right? Everything you, you feed it, that's what it, it does. So, okay, here's a perfect example. One day we were living in Mexico and I wanted to buy some flowers for my babe. So I went out to find some flowers and it was a dozen red roses and he had like three different bouquets and he's like, which one do you want? And and inside of one of the dozen red rows was a bright blue rose. And I was like, that's really cool. I'll buy it. But how did you do that? I mean, it doesn't exist. He's like, oh, it's super easy. You take a white rose, you clip off the bottom, and we stick it in blue dye. And the white rose just sucks it up, pew, turns the petals bright blue. 
And I was like, oh, yes. Took it home. We put it in a vase, put it up on the mantle. And I remember I wrote that down in my notes. I'm like, input determines output. Like, it, what you consume shapes you, colors you, right? And it colors our perspective on life and the world. It, like, some of us are feeling pretty discouraged, pretty frustrated. Anybody feeling a little hopeless some days? All you got to do is watch the news for a little bit and think the whole world's falling apart, right? And then you're like, what's the point? It's easy to start thinking like that. So please protect, protect your mind. In fact, I'm going to take this so far, you guys, may I? I'm going to take this so far. I want you to be the boss of your life. And I want you to see yourself like this super top executive CEO of a major corporation that people are trying to get time with and attention with. And you set up all these barriers and like, oh, no, no, no. Like I am very very careful about who gets time and presence with me. Like be that, be the boss, be the boss and be like, look, my thoughts, my time, my attention, my decisions, everything are so precious, so important. Like I'm, I'm setting up serious barriers here that I'm not going to let any trash in because you've all heard the garbage in garbage out. Right. So tighten up, tighten that up big time. Okay, any, anything else or any other questions? We can do like a Q&A here too. Like, but I just want physiologically look at it. Like, what can I do physically to make sure that I'm giving my cells all the tools they need to really function well so I feel good? Because if you're, if you're off physically, I promise you'll feel off emotionally. Then the other side is psychologically. What can I do to give my mind the best chance at happy, hopeful, empowered, clear thinking? Actually, one more thing I want you to do is psychology. Will you write down and share some empowering thoughts or beliefs that either A, you have used or B, you want to start using? Because our endophagia, endophagia is the fancy word for self-talk. It's, it's the conversation we're having with ourselves. For a lot of people, our endophagia is really mean and negative. When I, when I ask people, when I ask audiences, what's the most common negative thought you have? It's something around, you're not good enough. I'm not enough. I'm not good enough. I, I don't think I can do this. Right? And, and then all the way down to, you're stupid. You can't do this. That'll never happen. Like all these negative things. So we have to deliberately and proactively come up with words and phrases that are empowering. So what's a thought or a belief that you want to embrace and say to yourself often to help you get back into and stay into a positive state. Let's share some of those. Healthy and strong. That's one in our home. I'm healthy and strong. I'm healthy and strong. So you'll hear Rachel and I say that a lot when we're not feeling well. <laughs> we're not walking around like, oh, I don't feel so good. We're like, I'm healthy and strong. I'm healthy and strong. I'm healthy and strong. I don't necessarily say it with that smile. I'm like, I'm healthy and strong. <laughs> Rachel has a death mask on and says, I'm healthy and strong. I'm going to make it. <laughs> and the kids are like, oh, we're losing mom. <laughs> oh, love it. Um, <clears throat> nice. So here's a great one, Emily. Thank you. We can all stop when we catch ourselves saying or repeating something negative. We can always stop and ask, do I really believe this is true? What a beautiful thing. Just stop yourself. If, you, if you're repeating to yourself like, I'm, gosh, I'll never be able to succeed at this. I'm not good enough. I'm not young enough. I'm not old enough. I'm not smart enough. I'm not whatever enough, right? And just stop and say, do I, do I really believe that? Really? And if you do, you need to call me. Because <laughs> I will crash your pity party. And uh, come on, of course, you're amazing. Let's go, right? Like, turn that around. Here's another great one. Thank you. I'm capable, committed, and cheerful. That's an excellent one. I really like that one. I'm capable, committed, and cheerful. Well, wait a minute. What if you're having a bad day? 
can you still be capable, committed, and cheerful? Yes, you can. Um, one of my clients, one of my coaching clients, I get to meet with her every week and I've, I've been meeting with her for over a year and she is like super uber pregnant, right? <laughs> she's, she's like having contractions every day. She put herself on bed rest just because she wants to wait till at least Friday, right? <laughs> so like you, you, you moms know how, like so uncomfortable. And we were doing a coaching session a few weeks ago and <clears throat> she was like, I don't want to be like an honorary mom. I don't want my kids to remember my pregnancy as like, oh yeah, mom was not pleasant. And so I posed the question, is it possible to be pleasant and uncomfortable? Rachel says, I'm not so sure. <laughs> Honest, just this in this moment <laughs> she's not feeling very pleasant just saying <laughs> uh, but no honestly like in the moment you're like yeah it's hard but is it possible yes <clears throat> and i think one of the coolest things we can do psychologically is to separate that and say okay if even if i'm not feeling physically very well i can still choose to at least have a pleasant emotional state and mental state right Who's with me on this? It's possible. You ever met somebody who had a chronic, il chronic illness and still was so pleasant and cheerful? Yeah, it's amazing, isn't it? It's so beautiful. So we can do that. Okay, here's another one. Um, yeah, so Emily's saying, I, like, I also like how you guys say, this is one of Rachel sings. I have more than enough time and money for everything I need and want. What a great thing to say. Like, no, like, I, don't, I don't have to worry about scarcity of money and time. I have more than enough time and money for everything I need and want. Right. And it's just, it settles it. And it doesn't, it doesn't discount all the things we want to do and want to achieve. Right. If you guys still want to get that private jet, just keep working on it. Right. Mm -hmm. But what a great, what a great mindset to say, no, I'm, I'm good. I have more than enough time and money for everything I want and need. Okay, let's open it up. Anything here? Are you gonna, you said you were gonna go back to something. Did you see that already? Oh, I was gonna go like changing your state. Oh yeah. So I'll just give you a couple quick tips that I use myself and I give to my clients. So anytime, anytime you're gonna, um, it's actually useful any transition. So when you get up in the morning, start it. When you switch from alone time to kid time, when you switch from or spouse uh, time, or spouse time yeah. when you switch from um, family time to work time, and then from work time back to family time when you're going into a meeting. Um, I know some of you uh, treat patients or clients in between patients, right? It's important to do that because why well, you could carry you could carry attention or something from patient to patient, irritation. right? Oh, what? Irritation. You could carry an irritation, right? So a lot of my coaching clients happen, ironically, happen to be dentists, right? Uh, again, transitions, right? And and we're moving from patient to patient or client to client or kid to kid have you ever been really upset at one kid and that carries over to the poor other innocent kid yeah you, you know it has and like that poor little innocent kid gets this Wah! and you're like sorry it was the other one <laughs> like we, we got to learn how to do that so here's here are some simple tools and strategies and we've already covered them but this it just works just pause and it doesn't have to be long just pause and release release whatever's there like you can get to where you can do this in seconds so you just release whatever tension's there. You just blow it out. I actually teach what's called a, a two-minute release um, meditation. And all you do is every time you breathe out, you just say the word release in your head. Release. 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 It is so relaxing. If, if you're one of those people that gets wound up really tight or you're really tense, just do a release meditation. Two minutes sometimes if you need it. Sometimes 30 seconds would be enough, but you got to release everything that's there. Ooh, some of you, how many of you operate on high stress? Any, any stressies in here? So we'll call them like, it's like Trekkies, right? It's like stressies. They, we get addicted to stress and stress is happening a lot here. So these kind of things, we just, just let it go man. let it go. So then 
Um, breathe that out and do some deep breathing. Do some deep breathing, then move your body, right? And this can be arm swings. It can be rotations. It can be marching in place. Holy cow, my muscles are sore. Um, it can be bouncing in place. It can be jumping jacks. For, I like when you bend over. Uh, Rachel likes just bending over and touching your toes. Oh, feel the hamstrings stretch. That's amazing. For those of you are, who are crazy hardcore, I'm really tempted to mention some names here. You guys want to do like burpees. Go all in. <laughs> Go all in. <laughs> do some burpees. <laughs> um, so move your body and then get some good input. So it might be a quote. Um, those of you who've been with us for a long time or listen to my podcast, I have my philosophy journal right here. And um, my philosophy journal has, is filled with really great quotes and ideas, uh, principles of how this is the constitution for my life. I can read a couple of things from here and I'm like, yes, let's go. Right. And just get my mindset back. You can read from a great book. One that you just, every time you open that book, it just touches your soul. Right. Keep that book around. Get it on Audible, get it on hardback, get it in a digital form, like have it with you all the time. If you need to reset your mind, spend a few minutes with that author, right? I, I can do that with James Allen, like as a man thinketh all day long, man. Just a couple of lines from James Allen. I'm like, ah, oh, I'm good. I'm good. And you can reset, right? So a little, little meditation, a little bit of release, and then choose your emotion. That's the last thing I'd say. Just stop. Stop whatever's happening. If you're frustrated, you're irritated, you're upset, you're angry, you're depressed, you, whatever, you're scared, stop, notice it. Do what I just walked you through. Just do all that. And then cho choose your emotions. Say, what do I want to feel right now? And then choose it. That's what I did for this, you guys. Physically, I feel horrible. But mentally and emotionally, I'm crazy excited to be here with you guys talking about how amazing the brain is. And if we can make these little tweaks, little adjustments to our psychology, it'll literally change the trajectory of our lives. So I, I circle back. 80% of your success is psychology. 80% of what you want to work on, what you want to achieve is your psychology. Whether it's getting in the best health of your life or getting in the greatest wealth of your life. It's all going to come down to your psychology. And so the key is getting a really clear awareness of what you're currently thinking and then transform that into what you need to be thinking. And if, again, address the physiology too, because you can't, you can't be like, oh yeah, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to think more positively while you're eating junk food. It doesn't work. The junk food literally affects the, the positivity of your thinking. I know you may not think that's related, but it totally is. Okay. All right. That's it. I'm done. Any questions? Any questions about this or any questions at all? We'll just open up for Q&A. And we have our little guest here sitting in the corner. She can answer some questions <laughs> if it's not too much strain on her. <laughs> but anything's for a game. What do you got? If not, you just need to tell us like some cool stories from your life right now, things you're working on. There's no questions. I answered everything you can think of about your brain. <laughs> Do any of you struggle with like sleep inertia? When you wake up, your brain doesn't function. Or you guys all just hop out of bed like, I'm awake, energized, and alive. Excited for a new day. Yeah, that's what I thought. <laughs> you guys are amazing. I still struggle with sleep inertia. <laughs> Thank you, Amy. Man, we hope we feel better too. This is no fun. Mostly it's just annoying because I got big dreams and goals I want to work on. And I'm sitting here like, I don't feel very inspired right now. You did take like a three hour nap. That's true. I took a three hour nap, you guys. That's something that this man never does. And I was out cold. And when I woke up, I still felt like crap. <laughs> <laughs> So who knows? Okay. Anything else? Nothing? Ah, you guys are the best. Okay, then I have a question for you. We'll wrap up with this. Everyone put in one thing. I want everyone put in one thing 
you're going to do moving forward this week to level up your, your mental mastery, either physio physiological or psychological. Just choose one thing. Because what we, what we don't want to do is go away from something like this and like, oh yeah, all those good things, we could totally work on that and that would make things better and then not do anything. So everybody pick one thing you're going to commit to doing better to level up your psychology. Okay, Rachel says positive morning input. Ooh, she has not been doing that. In fact, what she has been doing is consuming dystopian content. <laughs> that people send to me. <laughs> <laughs> that everyone keeps sharing. They're like, oh, the world is full. You guys, it's, you know it's interesting when you read the book 1984 and you read the news headlines and they sound very, very similar. <laughs> Something sounds fishy. <laughs> oh man, feels like we're living in a dystopian novel. Okay, so more positive input in the morning. That's something I've done really since I was 18. If I could pick something that has literally changed the course of my life, it's that. I do not miss good input in the morning. Miss a meal if you have to, you guys. Well, I miss a meal too. Yeah, she's like, I miss meals I'm too. Not eating <laughs> I haven't eaten for days. I haven't done anything. <laughs> Wait, have I even got out of bed? Uh, so get some good input. Okay, um, here we go. Emily says, eat healthier. Can I, those of you, and then Amy <laughs> says, cleaner eating. Um, I knew. Yes, that's where I'm going. Rachel's like, I know exactly where you're going. You got to be more specific. Because if you just say eat healthier or cleaner eating, like it, that's a good idea in philosophy, but our brain doesn't know how to put that into practice. If you walk away and say, I'm going to eat better. And your brain's like, yeah, what in the world does that mean? Where if you say no more soda, and, and you guys, like you don't have to go crazy about that one. I only want you to commit for the rest of your life. <laughs> okay. It's not, it's not like that. You don't, I don't, you don't have to make it a big deal. Just never drink it again. Right. Um, that's one your mind can wrap, you know, right. I can't grab onto. So no more soda. Boom. Done. There you go. That's good. Go on a sugar fast. Um, dramatically cut back simple carbohydrates. So if you eat lots of bread or rice or chips or just cut that way, way, way back. If you love sandwiches, eat open sandwiches with one slice of bread instead of two right? You just, start just pick that. something like that and just start cleaning it up. I, I had decided that I'm only eating things like bread and sugars, which includes more fruit on my cheat days, which are twice a week. Okay. So Rachel has, she's established cheat days twice a week where she allows herself to eat more fruit because fruit is still high sugar. So more fruits and like breads and things two days a week. Okay. Um, so like if you go to Subway and they give you bread, take it and throw it back and say, I don't want this crap. What are you trying to do to my brain? Jeez. <laughs> and then just eat the paper. No, I'm just kidding. Just kidding. Okay, here we go. Um, update the vision boards. Yes. Oh my goodness. Thank you. You got, I got my vision board right here and I updated it a few weeks ago when we got back. Having a vision of where you're going is so helpful for our psychology. It's amazing. It gives you something to think about, to dream about. It gives you hope. <laughs> Even when the world is crazy, right? Yeah, update your vision boards. That's a great one. Okay, uh, here's another one. Write down my plan and successes on daily actions to make progress. Yes, yes, yes. Um, more and more, you guys, I'm using a little three by five card and having my clients do the same thing. Just write down like five or six things you want to do and just every day put a check. Either check it off if you did it. And if you didn't, look at it and go, I didn't check that off. Not okay, self. Right? Like, just, just track. It's really easy. That's a, that's a really great way to do that. Um, next, here's another one. I'm going to start saying out loud, I choose happiness. Yes. Hopefully this will rub off on my kids and keep me having good days. I promise it will. I promise it will. 
If your kids hear you and see you deliberately choosing happiness and not when it's just convenient, not when it's just comfortable and easy, not when things, you know, some of us are only happy when everything is going our way. When you choose happiness in spite of things not working out, that is awesome. That's a really great one. Okay. Um, okay, here it is. Okay, fine, Greg. I'm doing a super detox for one week. Ah, uh, yeah. Okay, people. This is kind of like an auction. I know you didn't know this, but basically she just upped the, she just upped the bid there. Everyone's got to level up a little more. <laughs> What are you going to do now? <laughs> um, one of my coaching clients right now, <clears throat> he's trying to lose, he's like insanely busy uh, senior executive at this new merger, right? And like just swamped. So he is in a high pressure position, but he wants to get healthy. And he, he because of time constraints and he loves food, he got overweight. And he's like, oh, I got to stop. And I'm like, hey, well, we're not going to sit around and talk about it. Like, let's go. And, and so I was like, this, it's happening. And so he, he agreed to do a three-day fast, right? And those are actually really, really good for you guys. If it, You know, it's still water, tons and tons of water. You just drink water like crazy. But he did a three-day fast. Um, and it's a good way to kind of reset the whole body. You guys, he lost 12 pounds in <laughs> three days. He was like, yeah. This is amazing. I feel awesome. <laughs> right. Because he's got a lot of weight to lose, but he did a three day fast and now he's doing intermittent fasting. Right. So he's still eating, eating healthy, ramping up his exercise. Now he's on a trajectory to get to the best health of his life. And it's super exciting. He's probably going to start doing um, triathlons again. Um, okay. So, okay. You guys ready? You in? Anybody ready, anybody ready to commit to uh, no sugars, no soda? Everyone's like, not yet. Wait, Don't you? make me. <laughs> Let's see. What am I going to do? Rachel has been criticizing me every day about <laughs> eating fruit. And you men, the men out there know how hard it is to just not be negatively affected by your wife's <laughs> criticism. So mine this week is not going to let Rachel's criticism get to me. <laughs> and keep eating apples. Uh, no. Uh, let's see. Mine. <clears throat> well, you can eat grapes. And... That's, that's I've had like six grapes in two weeks. <sighs> yes. All right, we'll take this off camera for later, you guys. Rachel and I are gonna have a wrestling match right now, and I think I'm totally gonna win because she is not feeling well. So okay, um, mine. I'm I'm chasing a really huge goal right now. I love this time of year because for me, it's the end of a race. I, I like I see it in my mind as we're turning August is turning the corner and this last stretch towards December 31st. And I'm chasing a really, really big goal, like a big dumb goal. You guys know my dumb goal, demanding, unrealistic, meaningful, and bold. I'm chasing a big dumb goal. And I have to, if, if I'm going to get anywhere close, I have to have my psychological game on, a game. I got to be solid. So I'm working on that of making sure I am in a state of absolute certainty and like, I'm generating and working from my very best place. And I, I have to be there in order to do this well. And so that's, that's my commitment. That's my focus. Like get into that peak state and operate from that so that I'm moving forward and my goal is not like, oh, hope this works out. Because that, that kind of stuff leads to mediocre outcomes. Okay. Anything else? You guys are the best. Man, have an amazing evening. Go smooch on your spouse. Go hug your kids. Go do like a little dance. Turn on a good song and dance around. Write down some good goals and ideas. Like, and, and, and actually take action. Take some kind of action on whatever your commitment is for this week. Take action on that some way, somehow. Just like leave, leave this moment by taking a, pro, a positive action in that direction for one. Okay. 
Love you guys. You're the best. Have a fantastic evening. Thanks for being here. Thanks for being awesome. Thank you. We're yeah, we'll feel better. Or we won't and we'll die. But if we do, we love you guys so much. Promise we do. Uh, if we die though, it won't be because of COVID, it'll be because of boredom. It's so annoying. <laughs> the V <V-sick. laughs> sick. Just kidding. Love you guys. You're the best. Have an awesome week. Reach upward.